Welcome back. Here we are for part two of chapter nine. The first part of this dealt with water and fluid balance. And now we're jumping right over to thermoregulation, a very important topic for an athlete. Okay, off we go. This is Dr. Jenkins, by the way, but you know that. Off we go. Here's our outline. Let's just jump right in. Now, I like to begin this chapter by talking about perhaps the most extreme test of the body's ability to thermoregulate. And you've by now, I'm sure, heard of ultra marathons. I mean, a marathon of 26.2 miles, <laughs> that's easy these days. Not really. But ultra marathons can be 50 miles, 100 miles, or more. So the Badwater Ultra Marathon is a 135 mile running race in Death Valley, California, in the summer. Okay, people think I'm crazy for doing the Ironman or whatever. This is really crazy. Um, in addition to the threat to thermoregulation, we also have a climb. So there's a total of or you climb up to uh, 8,000 feet above sea level. Whew. Now these are old records. They've probably been beaten by now. Um, but can you imagine? Right, so here's some pictures. In terms of thermoregulation, what you see, you're in the desert here, but you see these people wearing long sleeves and that's to protect their skin from the sun. But as we'll talk about later, um, these clothes should not be cotton. They should be breathable. And they each have a support van that follows them and they can take a break and go in there for an hour and ice down or whatever. But absolutely crazy. I can't think of anything more taxing to our body's ability to get rid of heat uh, and thermoregulate. All right, so let's just jump in. Similar to how we talked about fluid balance, remember? We talked about needing to bring in as much fluid as fluid that you lose. So if someone's exercising in the heat, they're losing more fluid, they've got to bring in more water. Well, just like that, we've got to manage our body's temperature. You know this, and your body does it for you but it's without a doubt something we need to consider as athletes. Our normal body temperature is what, 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit? Uh, I wanna say that's like 37 to 38 degrees Celsius, okay? Those are our normal body temperature. We can vary a little bit, a little bit higher, a little bit lower, um, but if we're exercising in the heat and we're increasing the heat taken on by the body, we better find ways to get rid of more of that heat. If not, it could lead to heat illness, potentially even death. You don't need to know these numbers, um, so don't worry about that. But I just wanted to put it out there just because. Okay, so we're gonna talk about ways in which our body takes on heat or gains heat, and ways in which our body can get rid of heat, okay? And it should be a balance. Let's go back to ways in which our body can take on heat. You should know these. Our body generates some heat just by it being itself. So we already know about basal metabolism. These are the chemical reactions or the calories burned just to keep our organs going. Well, just to keep your heart pumping, just to keep your liver working, um, we're gonna give off a little bit of heat. And that's why our body temperature is a little toasty, right? So we do generate some heat just because our organs are working. Um, hormones, hormone release can generate some heat, but you don't need to know that. When we digest food, because they are chemical reactions, heat is given off, but we're not gonna worry about that either. But let's talk about the three that I would like you to know. Well, when we exercise, our muscles generate heat. 
That's why when you exercise, your core temperature goes up. So if we exercise, and of course our core temperature goes up, our body's gonna have to find ways to get rid of that excess heat, and it does. The obvious example is through sweating. And we can also take on heat from the environment. If it's really hot out, that heat is going to be taken on by your body. And this is, of course, variable. So we do not generate more heat in the wintertime if we're out exercising from the environment. We, of course, generate heat from our muscles no matter what, no matter if it's cold or hot out. But when it's hot out, uh, we are going to take on more heat, and there, therefore we need to get rid of more heat. So make sure you know these three ways that our body generates heat. In terms of what happens to these mechanisms and exercise, technically when we exercise, the amount of heat we generate through digestion goes down. You do not have to know this slide, okay? If you're interested, when we exercise, our body shunts more blood flow and more energy to our working muscles and it actually takes some energy and some blood flow away from our GI tract. So even though our GI tract is still working when we're exercising, it's not working nearly as much. So therefore we're not generating as much heat. All the rest of the things go up with exercise. But again, don't worry about this for an exam. Um, I am gonna point out and I put these on the, on the screen before. Here is our normal body, core body temperature at rest. When we exercise, we expect it to go up a little bit. So what I'm gonna ask you to know here is with exercise, we, we expect core temperature to rise because we're generating more heat because our muscles are working more and we can handle a small increase in core temperature I'm not going to ask you these numbers yet we'll talk later about the numbers I want you to know but these are the two points. When we exercise, we know core temperature is going to go up. And when we exercise, we can handle it going up a little bit. So if you're exercising and your core temperature goes from 37 degrees to 38.5, that is okay. Fine. What we're going to find out is very large elevations in core temperature are dangerous. We can handle a little bit of a core temperature increase during exercise, but we rely on our heat dissipation mechanisms to keep it only to be a small rise in core temperature. Because if it increases too much, we could have dangerous effects. Um, all the rest here is extra. You don't need to know it. I think this middle point is interesting but you don't need to know it, okay? So it's interesting to note that heat production is directly proportional to our exercise intensity. Not so much duration, even though it does go up with duration, um, but it's much more of a direct relationship. Or let me say that again. It's much more of a proportionate increase, proportionate relationship with exercise intensity. The harder the intensity, the more your core temperature will rise because the harder your muscles are working. Okay, here's what I wanna ask you to know. We've already said that a small increase in core temp when we exercise is normal, but large elevations in core temperature can lead to problems. I'd like you to know this number, these numbers. When we see our core temperature go up four to five degrees Celsius, that's the point when we start to really worry. Okay? So when our, if our core temperature goes up two degrees Celsius, 
during exercise, eh, we're probably okay. To be expected. But the magic number, when we see our core temperature go up, four to five degrees Celsius, that's when we'll start to see some dysfunction. And uh, those problems can start to occur very quickly. So I am asking you to know those numbers. Nice and clear as always, everyone. Okay, so we talked about the ways in which our body generates heat from our basal metabolic rate through our muscles working and through the external environment, right? These are the three ways in which our body generates heat. Well, what are the ways that we can get rid of that excess heat? And there's only four ways, okay? Radiation, conduction, conve convection, evaporation. I want you to know all of these because our body utilizes all of them. Make sure you know their definition. We know about evaporation, don't we? Because the best example of evaporation is sweating. So indeed, one way that our body can get rid of heat is to send blood, which is water, to the surface of the skin, and then those water droplets evaporate off of the surface, surface of the skin, and that has a cooling effect on the body. Radiation is um, just transfer of, well, it says here, transfer of heat through electromagnetic It really just means transfer of heat out into environment. So if I was going to simplify it, that's how I would simplify it. Transfer of heat out into the environment. And then make sure you review conduction and convection. Conduction is transfer of heat through direct contact. I've given you an example. If you sit on a really cold chair, well, in a minute, that chair is not going to be cold anymore because you've transferred your heat onto that cold chair. Convection is transfer of heat through air or liquid, not direct contact necessarily, but air or liquid. So using a fan um, or splashing cold water onto your face. Make sure you review all of these, my sports nutrition friends. Okay. Um, you don't need to know this, but I just like diagrams sometimes because it really gives a picture. Um, there's a lot happening as we exercise, okay? You don't have to know this, but I'm just showing you this. You know, we generate heat through our muscles. Well, actually, that arrow, I think, should be going the other way around, shouldn't it? It doesn't really make sense. We generate heat through our muscles working. We generate heat through our metabolism, basal, basal metabolic rate. And we generate heat as it's taken in from the environment. Okay, so the yellow arrows are ways in which we are generating heat in our body or taking on heat. We have to balance that with getting rid of it we can release heat out into the environment, radiation. We can sweat. I'm not sure why they have the sweating down by the knee. It's not really a huge sweat spot, but we can sweat and release little droplets of sweat into the air through evaporation. As we're running through the air, we can release some heat through convection um, if we were touching something cooler, we could release heat through conduction, but it all plays together. All right. Now, here's what I want to talk about. At rest. At rest, when you're not exercising and the conditions are relatively ambient, which means not too hot, not too cold. Ambient means like right in the middle. The biggest mechanism of heat loss we rely on is radiation. We may rely on the others too, even at rest. But what we rely on most when we're at rest 
in a temperature neutral environment is radiation. However, once we switch to exercise, radiation alone or just using radiation as our primary means isn't going to cut it. So when we exercise, we rely most on evaporation. And you know this because when you start to exercise, we do a lot more sweating. For both, we're still utilizing all four means, radiation, conduction, convection, evaporation. I'm just pointing out what we rely most on at rest, radiation. We can even remember that because at rest, R, R for radiation. But when we exercise, we're going to begin relying mostly on evaporation. Okay, let's talk more about it. When we exercise in a hot environment, I'm recording this in July. This particular year, it's been a very hot summer here in upstate New York. When we exercise, we generate more heat. Body, keep it simple. Not only do we generate more heat because our muscles are working harder, we also generate more heat because the environment adds more heat. And there's things that go along with it. Okay. You don't have to know this for now, but when we generate more heat in our body, and we sweat more, there's a lot of secondary impacts. When we sweat more, our fluid volume goes down. So if you don't rehydrate to the proper amount, you're gonna have a lower fluid volume and be in a dehydrated state. This can lead to a drop in blood pressure. So we have less fluid in our bloodstream being pumped out with less force, which means not as much and to a much less degree in terms of force are we delivering supplies to the muscles okay so you don't need to know these for now i'm just setting the stage for later um this is a table that came from your book i am not going to ask you any of these specifics but i do like the jake and droop text because ladies and gentlemen it gives us the science so it shows us how things change as the outside temperature goes up. When the temperature goes up in the environment, as we're exercising, we sweat more because our body's generating more heat. We got to sweat more. And look, as the outside temperature goes up, the body's core temperature goes up. As you can see, this person exercising for 60 minutes in 95 degree Fahrenheit heat has a core temperature of 40. We're edging up towards a danger zone. Remember the normal core temperature is about 37 degrees Celsius? And I said four, four or five degrees more than that, you're gonna see some serious dysfunction. And just as an aside, even though I'm not gonna ask you this, Remember, this is just all extra. Um, I do want to point out, just for extra, that as we lose more sweat and we become dehydrated, don't have as much fluid volume, the heart rate goes up to try and make up the difference. If we don't have as much blood to pump out and the blood is being pumped out with less force, you will always see uh, the body try and make up for that by increasing the heart rate. Okay. Okay. Something else that happens, let me see here. Um, okay, this is saying what we already said. Um, everything else here is extra. When we're exercising, especially when we're exercising in a hot environment, we're gonna rely mostly on evaporation. These are still working, but they're not able to get rid of enough heat to keep the balance saying what we already know. 
So what are some recommendations? Well, I think a lot of these are common sense, but I know myself and perhaps you know yourself or other people. Um, even though sometimes we know the common sense, we don't always listen to it. Um, and preparation is key. So it's important to look ahead and be prepared. Prehydrate and then maintain hydration before, during, and after. Make sure you have enough fluid, the right kind of fluid. Make sure that you're actually following through with doing it. When it's really hot, folks, don't try and be a tough guy or a tough gal. Maybe when you're younger, you can get away with that. But even if you can get away with it, it's probably um, impacting your exercise performance. So do not shy away from finding some shade. If you're running and you can run one foot further to your right and be in the shade and it's really hot, do it. You want to slowly acclimatize, which we'll talk about later, meaning you want to slowly get your body more used to it. On the first day, it's 90 degrees outside, don't go for an hour run. On the first day, it's 90 degrees, run outside for 10 minutes. Next time it's 90 degrees, run outside for 15 minutes. Something like that. And um, make sensible clothing choices. Uh, loose fitting is actually better because it makes your skin more breathable. So it could actually produce the sweat and it makes the sweat much more likely to be able to evaporate. Um, a light color is better. Something that is moisture wicking. Um, okay. Have a hat on. Shade your face. Okay. Now, it's not only the temperature of the heat outside we have to worry about, it's also the humidity. And I'll discuss this also in our lab that goes along with thermoregulation. Um, if we were looking at Albany on the bottom compared to Las Vegas, well, Las Vegas might be 105 degrees outside. Albany might be 90 degrees Fahrenheit but these could feel very different. Las Vegas has more of a dry heat. Here in the East Coast, we're much more likely to have a moist heat or humidity. So that 90 degrees with humidity can feel much worse than even 105 degrees dry. If you've ever been to a place where it's dry heat, oh, you can feel the heat, but it's not as oppressive as it can be when there's that humidity. So let's talk about it you can define what humidity is. Humidity is the presence of water vapor in the air. So the reason why a hot, humid environment feels like a wet blanket on you is because there's literally extra droplets of water in the air. And here's how it influences our ability to thermoregulate. And I'm just going to explain it. It kind of goes through these two points. So I'm going to explain it. When there is a low humidity condition, let me draw exercising dude. Terrible drawer. When exercising dude is outside, but it's low humidity, he's going to sweat. This is my sweat coming off of him. And because it's low humidity, that sweat is going to be able to go from high water concentration on his skin to lower water concentration in the air. Things like to go from high to low. That's what diffusion is, ladies and gentlemen. Things move from high to low. Okay? So when it's not humid, our sweat little droplets of water on the skin are able to evaporate because we have more, we have a very high water concentration on skin and we have that concentration gradient. High water to low water. That's what we want because then the sweat will evaporate. But what happens, this guy's got a frown because it's hot. And if it were me, I would have like crazy, bushy, frizzy hair because I got curly hair, right? So when it's humid out, my hair just 
puffs out. So when it's humid out, your body is going to try and put the same amount of water droplets on your skin. But now we've got a higher concentration of water in the air. Higher than it was, say, in Las Vegas. So now we have a high water concentration on skin and we have a high water concentration in the air. We no longer have a concentration gradient. So not nearly as much of this sweat is going to be able to evaporate. Instead, that water on your skin is just gonna roll right off you. And if it rolls right off of you and it's not evaporating, then you're not having that cool effect. Okay, this is real, ladies and gentlemen. All right. As always, if you have questions, feel free to ask me. You can pause the video, go back, listen to my amazing voice as many times as you want. It's not amazing. I'm just joking. Okay. Um, I want to touch upon thermoregulation in cold environments before we continue. Um, so this is the opposite of wh where we were in the heat. Yes, that's Brett Favre back in the day. Okay, when it was a hot environment, our body generated more heat. When it's a cold environment, our body loses more heat. And that can be a problem too. This can also lead to some other effects on the body, um, but you don't need to worry about that. We still sweat, just not as much. And this is obviously less problematic overall. Okay. In terms of illness because heat illness is much more likely to happen in a hot environment than cold illness in athletes is likely to happen in a cool environment. Um, when it's cold, we're going to be focusing on releasing heat through radiation and conduction. Even though we do some evaporation, we don't rely on it as much. The rest here is all true, um, but I'm not going to have you know it, okay? So here's what I want to talk about with cold environments, how to handle it. I think a lot of this is self-explanatory, but I want to make a point. In cold environments, you cannot acclimatize. And I mean this in a significant physiological way. Okay? Now... Of course, if you grew up in Florida and you come up here to New York in the wintertime, it's going to feel much colder to that person than it would to, say, someone who has been in New York all year round and all their life. So I understand that we get, quote unquote, used to certain temperatures. But I'm talking about significant physiological adaptations. If you would look at sweat rate between people who are used to the cold versus who are not, it's very similar. It's very different from the heat, okay? So we're able to, our body's able to create significant physiological adaptations to get used to the heat. Not that we can get used to any temperature, even if it's 110 degrees, but we can, and we'll talk about acclimatization to heat a little bit later. But when we talk about cold, you can kind of, quote unquote, get more used to it, but there is not a significant physiological adaptation. Instead, when it comes to the cold, how do we handle it? We create a micro environment. So the best, really the best way that we can get used to or handle exercising in the cold is by creating a micro environment, which means wearing more clothes, 
having this to keep your hands warm. So we're creating a little micro environment in this to keep Brett Favre's hands warm. You're putting on long sleeves to create a warmer micro environment for your body. You can read through the rest of these recommendations. They are um, common sense, but please do read through them. Okay, let me just see what's ahead to make sure. Okay, a couple more slides and then we're gonna end the first part of this video. But, you know, we do have ways to objectively measure heat and humidity together, gives us a heat illness. And we have ways to objectively measure the effect of a cold temperature with the wind. So just like we had to look at heat and humidity when it's hot, you have to look at cold temps and wind when it's cold. Okay, so these are both things to consider, and here's the heat index chart, and here's the wind chill, I almost said windmill, wind chill chart. Okay, we'll stop the first part of this video here, and I'll see you for the rest.